2005, the HBO series Entourage featured a storyline in which the character of Vincent Chase, played by Adrian Grenier, starred in a film version of Aquaman directed by James Cameron. Some might say, why would they do this knowing that Warner Brothers may actually want to make an Aquaman film in the future? At that time, there was very little chance that an Aquaman film would ever make it to the big screen. The closest the character had ever come to appearing in a movie at that point was a 2006 television pilot for The CW, starring Justin Hartley and Lou Diamond Phillips that was not picked up, which now can be found as a bonus on the 2009 animated feature Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. In 2010, an animated film by Bruce Timm never made it into production. Cancelled films are a very common occurrence in the world of cinema since its creation. The reasons can vary from lack of funding, conflict with producers, outside forces, and sometimes the most minute and petty of reasoning. With the ever-soaring popularity of superhero films, it's only inevitable that some of these projects would never see the light of day. Marvel has had to cancel a few projects over the years, from as far back as an Iron Fist movie in the early 2000s, to the far more recent loss of The Incredible Hulk 2 and The Inhumans being cancelled and reshaped into a TV show. However, when compared to DC, Marvel looks like it's never had to let a film fall by the wayside. DC has had dozens of projects shelved over the years. Some of these films very well may have been major hits beloved by fans or they could have been reviled and mocked for years to come. We may never know, but we can at the very least explain what they were going to be until for various reasons they were cancelled. In this video, we will talk about the production of five separate DC related films that were never released, what the plots may have been, and the possible reasons they were never destined to make it to the big screen. 1989's Batman was a runaway hit for Warner Brothers, so it was no surprise that a sequel was announced. What was a shock, however, was the film itself. Batman Returns was a significantly darker film with a grotesque penguin, a highly sexualized Catwoman, and a casually murdering Batman. For a short while, Burton was expected to make a third Batman film with rumors that he wanted Robin Williams as the Riddler. He was also interested in the concept of a film revolving around Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, one of the few aspects of Batman Returns that was critically praised at the time. Warner Brothers decided they didn't want Tim Burton directing yet another Batman film and wanted a more family-friendly picture, which eventually led them to Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever. WB, however, was interested in Burton's plan for a Catwoman spin-off film, so plans moved forward in June of 1993 with Pfeiffer returning as the titular character. Tim Burton and Batman Returns screenwriter Daniel Waters were also going to return as director and writer respectfully. The plot, from what little we know, was going to feature Catwoman suffering from amnesia after the events of Batman Returns. She would wander into a Las Vegas-style city run by male superheroes. She would eventually suit up to save the day when new threats emerged that the heroes could not handle. On June 16, 1995, the script was finished and turned in, but that was also the day Batman Forever was released. The film was a major box office hit and reinforced WB's perception that Batman was more profitable when it was family-friendly. Catwoman was quickly pushed back and eventually put into development hell. Tim Burton quickly left to direct Mars Attacks, so did Pfeiffer and the few others working on the film. Eventually, Ashley Judd was cast as Catwoman, but she left the project when little progress was made. The film as we know it died a quiet death in the late 90s, though the concept of a Catwoman film evidently was not forgotten by WB. They would continue to try and create a Catwoman film, eventually releasing the now infamous Halle Berry film in 2004. After the success of Batman Forever, Warner Brothers was eager to have a follow-up and a third movie out the door as soon as possible. That sequel would go on to become Batman and Robin, one of the most critically derided films of all time. During the filming, Warner Brothers was reportedly so impressed with the dailies they were receiving, they immediately gave Joel Schumacher the director's chair again. Akiva Goldsman, writer of Forever and Batman and Robin, wasn't interested in returning to write another Batman film, so future I Am Legend writer Mark Protasevich was brought in. Warner Brothers set the release date to be around mid-1999, and along the way, a title was given, Batman Unchained. The plot was to center around Batman fighting his past demons and severing the partnership with Robin. The villains were going to be Scarecrow and Harley Quinn, who was written to be a toy maker who discovers she is the Joker's daughter and demands vengeance for his death. The film's climax was to have Batman thrown into Arkham Asylum and injected with the Scarecrow's fear toxins. This would lead to an elaborate hallucination where Batman is put on trial for all his crimes with every villain from the series being present. Jack Nicholson, Danny DeVito, Michelle Pfeiffer, Jim Carrey, and Tommy Lee Jones were expected to return. Ultimately, Batman would break free, reconcile with Robin, and defeat the Scarecrow and Harley. 
The ending was to feature Batman traveling to Bali and entering a cave full of bats without fear. Nicolas Cage and rapper Coolio were considered for Scarecrow. Singers Courtney Love and Madonna were considered for the role of Harley Quinn. George Clooney and Chris O'Donnell were to reprise their roles as Batman and Robin respectively, though Alicia Silverstone's Batgirl was not expected to return. The movie was meant to be far darker and more mature than any of Schumacher's Batman films. This was because Batman Unchained was meant to be Schumacher's apology to the hardcore Batman fanbase. Schumacher had always wanted to do a darker Batman film, but WB kept making him do family-friendly pictures because they were more profitable. Ultimately, the entire project came crashing down when Batman and Robin was released on June 20, 1997. The film was torn apart by critics, but even more importantly, it made $100 million less than Batman Forever. WB quickly developed cold feet and after much deliberation, canceled Batman Unchained. They instead decided to create a Batman Beyond film and adapt Frank Miller's Batman Year One with director Darren Aronofsky. In the end, both of these potential films fell apart and were never made. Batman Unchained may have never made it to cinemas, but it did influence future Batman material to various degrees. Batman Unchained's final scene clearly inspired a similar cave scene in Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, and reportedly the plot of the 2015 video game Batman Arkham Knight was directly inspired by the script for Unchained. In 1986, father and son Ilya and Alexander Sulkind sold the rights to Superman to Canon Film's owner and cousins Menachem and Yorm Globus. This was a direct result of the poor reception of Superman 3 and the failure of Supergirl starring Helen Slater as the title character. The latter, a film that cost $35 million to make and only managed to earn $15 million at the box office. The result was the insultingly cheap Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. The cousins attempted to make a fifth Superman film but Canon Films went bankrupt and the rights reverted back to the Salkinds. They also tried and failed to make a fifth Superman film during the early 90s. In 1993, Warner Brothers reacquired the film and television rights to Superman, and the character enjoyed success on the small screen. The ABC television series Lois and Clark, starring Terry Hatcher as Lois Lane and Dean Cain as Superman, ran for a total of four seasons. Around that time, DC Comics had a runaway smash hit with the death of Superman comic storyline and Warner Brothers wanted to work on creating another Superman film based on it. However, they didn't want a film to compete with the television series, and because of Superman's demise in the comic, they also postponed a storyline where Superman married Lois Lane to coincide with their nuptials in the comic. When WB finally wanted to advance on their plans for a new Superman movie, they hired producer John Peters, who was well known as one of the producers on Tim Burton's Batman films, and for producing several films for singer Barbara Streisand. Peters was infamously well known in Hollywood as a straight-up bully someone who would strong-arm anyone who disagreed with him. Christopher Nolan went so far as to ban him from the set of Man of Steel, a film Peters produced. Peters eventually hired screenwriter Jonathan Lemkin, who was best known at the time for working on the Fox series 21 Jump Street, for the new film which was to be titled Superman Reborn. Lemkin's script was to be a loose adaptation of The Death of Superman and feature Clark Kent having severe relationship troubles with Lois Lane. Doomsday would eventually emerge, fight Superman, and he would die and eventually be reborn as Clark and Lois's son. When shown the script, Warner Brothers was evidently unimpressed, so Peters hired Gregory Poirier to rewrite the script. WB was quite pleased with Poirier's script, but still hired Clerks director Kevin Smith in order to do some rewrites. Smith thought very little of Poirier's script and believed it was highly disrespectful to the Superman mythos. He described the film as Superman being full of angst for not being able to save everyone in the world, and even a bit campy in certain spots. Smith's first meeting with John Peters reportedly went well, but he was shocked at how little he thought of Tim Burton during the making of Batman. He apparently told Smith, quote, You know the reason that Batman worked? You know that alleyway scene where he's fighting those sword-bearing guys and they're attacking him? Those guys are real swordsmen. That's why that movie made like $300 million, end quote. Smith pitched his story outline in 1996 and was allowed to write an entirely new screenplay under specific conditions. These conditions included Superman not being able to fly due to Peters believing he looked like an overgrown Boy Scout and Brainiac fighting a polar bear in the Fortress of Solitude. Peters also demanded Superman fight a giant spider in the film's third act. Smith reluctantly accepted and quickly realized he had just been hired to create a preordained idea. Because of the recent 20th anniversary release of the Star Wars trilogy, Peters once again made more demands for Smith. He now wanted a pet space dog for Lex Luthor purely for merchandising reasons. Smith at some point was told by Peters in no uncertain terms that merchandising came before his script, 
a situation similar to Batman and Robin. Peters now also wanted Chasing Amy actor Dwight Ewell to play Brainiac's robot assistant Elrond because he wanted a gay R2-D2 with attitude. Smith's script, now titled Superman Lives, was to center on Brainiac sending Doomsday to Earth to kill Superman. His plan was also to block out Earth's yellow sun, C. Montgomery Burns style, the source of Superman's power. Brainiac would later team up with Lex Luthor and kill Superman, only to be resurrected by a robot called the Eradicator. Brainiac then wishes to steal the Eradicator, but Superman later regains his strength and defeats all his enemies. Smith's cast would have included Ben Affleck as Superman and Linda Fiorentino as Lois Lane. Frequent Smith collaborators were also to appear, those being Jason Lee as Brainiac, Jason Mewes as Jimmy Olsen, and Michael Rooker as Lex Luthor. Robert Rodriguez was offered the chance to direct, but turned it down to work on the faculty instead. Smith originally asked for Tim Burton to direct, but at first he said no. He later said yes, agreeing to sign a $5 million pay-or-play contract. Burton brought in Cape Fear and Doom screenwriter Wesley Strick to rewrite Smith's script. Strick wasn't too impressed with Smith's script and made various changes to fit Tim Burton's vision. This included taking out the plan to block the sun and making Superman more of an existentialist. He also planned to merge Brainiac and Lex Luthor into one character named Lexiac. Smith left production not long after Strick's arrival. After Smith left, a myriad of actors' names were thrown out to play various characters. Christopher Walken, Jim Carrey, Tim Allen, and Gary Oldman were approached to play Brainiac. Sandra Bullock, Courtney Cox and Julianne Moore were all approached for Lois Lane, and Kevin Spacey was rumored for either Brainiac or Lex Luthor. Additionally, Chris Rock was meant to play Jimmy Olsen, and Michael Keaton was confirmed to be in the movie, possibly playing Batman in a cameo. Most famously, Nicolas Cage was chosen to play Superman himself, likely because of his recent Oscar win in Leaving Las Vegas. Cage signed a $20 million pay-or-play contract and firmly believed he could reconceive the character. John Peters agreed, saying Cage could, quote, convince audiences he came from outer space. In the summer of 1997, pre-production began with the studio aiming at early 1998 to start filming. Burton selected Pittsburgh to stand in for Metropolis, all the while the start of filming kept getting pushed back. Parts of the set were completed and Cage got as far as a costume fitting. WB eventually wanted them to change the title back to Superman Reborn and had quite a few issues with Strick's script. The studio thought it was far too expensive to shoot, so they hired Dan Gilroy, brother of Rogue One writer Tony Gilroy, to make some adjustments. Gilroy managed to bring down the budget from $190 million to $100 million. However, this still wasn't enough for WB to fast-track production, mainly due to financial difficulties with other film properties at the time. In the end, Warner Brothers put the film on hold in April of 1998, quickly causing Burton to leave in order to direct his Planet of the Apes remake. After what had been years in development, Warner Brothers had wasted $30 million on a production that still hadn't gone anywhere. Burton was quoted as saying, I basically wasted a year. A year is a long time to be working with somebody that you really don't want to be working with. In September of 1998, comic book artist Alex Ford had a script of his accepted at WB, but he quickly left after being told, much like Smith, how much more important merchandising was than his writing. With Gilroy's script still in use, John Peters went around Hollywood trying to find a director for the movie. At various points, he approached Michael Bay, Shakar Kapoor, and Martin Campbell, who all turned him down. In June of 1999, Terminator 2 and Judge Dredd writer William Wisher Jr. was asked to write yet another draft of the script. A year later, after little progress, Nicolas Cage dropped out. Wisher finished his script in August of 2000, with many claiming it had contained a lot of similarities to the 1999 classic movie The Matrix. At some point, Oliver Stone was asked to direct, but he also turned it down. Peters, in a last-ditch effort, asked Will Smith to play Superman, but he declined. The entire project was cancelled not long after, never to be revived. John Peters would later go on to produce nearly every Superman film up to Man of Steel, along the way failing to create a Superman film written by J.J. Abrams titled Superman Flyby. In late 2016, efforts were made to turn the original Kevin Smith script into an animated movie. These attempts also sadly failed. An interesting side note to this story is that in 1999, John Peters produced the film The Wild Wild West, directed by Barry Sonnenfeld and starring Will Smith and Kevin Klein. Oddly enough, in the film's third act, whether by coincidence or by design, Smith and Klein face off in battle against a giant mechanical spider. In early 1997, Warner Brothers was hoping to continue creating more superhero-based films to bolster its strength in the growing market. Batman and Robin was set to be released with a sequel not long after, and work was in progress on a reboot of Superman. WB was starting to think of other DC comic characters to bring to the big screen. 
and the consensus was Green Lantern needed a movie. They first asked Kevin Smith, who had just finished a draft of Superman Lives, but he turned it down due to having little interest in the character. Quentin Tarantino at one point was even asked to write a script for Green Lantern. By 2004, Warner Brothers had settled upon Robert Smigel, creator of Triumph the Insult comic Dog, to adapt Green Lantern into a motion picture. Warner Brothers wanted the film to be an action comedy, possibly even R-rated, which was something Smigel agreed with. Smigel asked his personal friend, actor-musician Jack Black to play Green Lantern. At first, Black said no, but after reading Smigel's hastily prepared script, he agreed to play the part. Black went so far as to personally submit a short list of directors for the film. Unfortunately, those who were named on the list remain unknown. The film was to be very comedic in style, in some ways similar to Deadpool. In this version of the film, comic books were readily available, so Black and a comic geek sidekick would make constant references and fourth wall breaking jokes such as quoting famous superhero phrases. The plot was to be a very loose adaptation of the Emerald Dawn storyline. Black would play a new character named Judd Plato, a reality star who eats extreme food such as dead animal carcasses. He's described as a talentless loser whose only ambition is to have sex with his boss, a woman named Corrine. The Lantern Power Ring mistakes him for a brave warrior and attaches itself to Plato. The Green Lantern Corps would then be summoned and attempt to teach Plato about his role in the universe. They would teach him by summoning a group of Muppet-style characters to explain his duties in musical form. Plato would also create an improvised theme song that he would sing at various points in the film. After a few scenes where Plato used his powers, one of which he would trap looters in a giant condom, the villain Legion was to appear and attempt to destroy the Earth. At the same time, Plato had to fight a rogue Green Lantern Corps member, Sinestro. Sinestro wanted to police the universe through surveillance and intimidation, a clear commentary at the time on the George W. Bush administration and the Patriot Act. Plato would defeat Sinestro just as Legion was beginning to destroy the world. Legion's plan was to push a massive yellow asteroid in the shape of the Pokemon character Pikachu towards the planet. Plato would save the day by creating a green Superman to reenact the ending of Richard Donner's 1978 film Superman the Movie. It took fans very little time to learn about the film and its tone. They were outraged almost immediately, and Warner Brothers quickly took note. The studio personally asked Smigel, what if it's not Green Lantern? What if it's very similar, but you change it and make it a fictional superhero so we can make it a stray comedy? Smigel quickly caught on that WB was put off by the fan reaction, and he was correct. The movie was dropped by the studio, and the idea of a comedic Green Lantern film was permanently shelved. The project would go through various writers and directors before being released as the 2011 Martin Campbell film titled Green Lantern, starring Ryan Reynolds. In February of 2007, it was announced to the world that Warner Brothers had hired the husband-wife duo of Michelle and Kieran Mulrooney to write the screenplay for Justice League. This announcement came at a time where many comic book films were being cancelled, such as Joss Whedon's Wonder Woman and David S. Goyer's The Flash. The film was quickly given the title Justice League Mortal, and the script reportedly heavily impressed WB. The script was heavily inspired by JLA Tower of Babel, as well as the OMAC project with a little bit of the animated series Justice League Unlimited thrown in. The plot was to open with a funeral for an unknown member of the Justice League. It would then flash back to the Justice League years after it was formed. World peace had been declared and for a while everyone celebrated. The main character was to be Barry Allen's Flash, who is depicted as a joking everyman alongside his friend Wally West. Later in the film, Martian Manhunter is viciously attacked by an unknown force. Each member of the Justice League tries to help but is quickly subdued by nanotechnology that exploits everyone's weakness. It is later revealed that Maxwell Lord, a friend of Bruce Wayne, has hacked into Batman's Justice League files with help from Talia al Ghul. Maxwell is seeking revenge on the unsuspecting world for allowing him to be experimented on as a child. The experiments have given him psychic powers. Eventually, the members of the Justice League would forgive Batman for having their weaknesses on file and battle Lord and his army of Omax cyborgs. In the end, The Flash would valiantly sacrifice his life by running so fast he sucks Lord and the Omac into oblivion. The film would then cut back to the funeral, revealing it was Barry Allen's coffin. Wally West promises to continue his legacy and joins the Justice League. As a result of the positive script, Warner Brothers fast-tracked it in the hopes to start filming before the looming Writers Guild of America strike. WB was not exactly willing to make it a sequel to the financially disappointing Superman Returns. Brandon Routh was reportedly not even approached to return as Superman. Neither was Christian Bale asked to return as Batman. WB stated that Justice League Mortal was to be the start of a new franchise, and eventually it would branch off into sequels and spin-offs featuring all of the characters. Christian Bale was quoted as saying, 
it'd be better if it doesn't tread on the toes of what our Batman series is doing. Bale also held out hope that Warner Brothers would delay the entire film to allow him to finish Batman 3, later titled The Dark Knight Rises. Jason Reitman, son of Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman, was the original choice for director. He turned it down, considering himself more of an independent director and not someone who made blockbusters. Shortly after, in September of 2007, Australian director George Miller of Mad Max was hired to direct a feature on a projected $220 million budget. In October, roughly 40 actors and actresses auditioned for roles in the massive ensemble cast. These included the likes of Joseph Cross, Adrian Palicki, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and Scott Porter. Miller had intended to cast younger, lesser-known actors so they could grow into the roles over the course of many years in films, similar to what we saw in the Harry Potter franchise. The massive cast was to include DJ Katrona as Superman, Army Hammer as Batman, Megan Gale as Wonder Woman, Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman, rapper Common as Green Lantern, and Adam Brody as The Flash. Jay Baruchel and Teresa Palmer were cast as the villains Maxwell Lord and Talia al Ghul. Additionally, longtime Miller collaborator Hugh Keyes Byrne was cast as Martian Manhunter. Costumes and sets were quickly created, first by designer Marit Allen, and later by Weta Workshops in January after Allen's unfortunate passing. Locations were scouted, eventually settling on Fox Studios Australia in Sydney. With mere days away from filming, the writer's strike began on November 5, 2007, halting the entire production until February when the strike finally ended. After the strike had passed, Miller immediately wanted to start filming. However, Warner Brothers delayed shooting by a full three months. Miller and his team quickly ran into another problem, this time the Australian Film Commission. Despite casting several prominent Australian actors and the entire production crew being Australian, the board felt that the movie didn't have enough Australians on the production. As a direct result, the Australian government denied Warner Brothers a 40% tax rebate. Miller was furious, stating, A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for the Australian film industry is being frittered away because of very lazy thinking. They're throwing away hundreds of millions of dollars of investment that the rest of the world is competing for and, much more significantly, highly skilled, creative jobs. Production was later moved to Vancouver, Canada, with filming pushed back to July of 2008. Warner Brothers was still confident that the project would still be completed by summer of 2009. On July 18th of 2008, Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight was released. The film was a massive critical and financial hit and quickly impacted Justice League Mortal. Warner Brothers changed its mind on the project. They would now focus development on individual films featuring the main heroes instead of starting with one film with all of them together. Gregory Novak, Vice President of Creative Affairs at DC stated, We're going to make a Justice League movie, whether it's now or 10 years from now, but we're not going to do it and Warner's is not going to do it until we know it's right. The production fully ceased not long after and all participants left for other endeavors. George Miller would later recount that it's probably for the best that Justice League Mortal never made it to theaters. He felt that some parts would have been beloved and other parts hated. He doesn't know if audiences would have liked it, but he does know that audiences enjoyed Mad Max Fury Road, a film he was free to direct after leaving Justice League Mortal. Warner Brothers, whether intentionally or not, seems to have a bad habit of killing projects, sometimes in the 11th hour, close to release. Producers are often given too much power and take a film in the wrong direction. They also can appear to get cold feet due to negative feedback or unrelated projects making money. While this isn't unique in Hollywood, in the world of comic book movies, it unfortunately is more closer to the norm. We won't ever know if Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman would have been more enjoyable than Halle Berry's film. It will forever remain unanswered if Joel Schumacher could have redeemed himself for the Batman fanbase with another film. Would Superman Lives have been a critical darling, beloved to this day? Would audiences have seen Jack Black star in a Green Lantern movie? And would DC have crushed Marvel if Justice League Mortal had not been prematurely cancelled? Of course, these questions are impossible to answer. But these films' legacies will live on in other ways, having inspired other projects or to serve as a warning to others on the perils of movie making. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini-documentaries, special behind-the-scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, 
and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.